Our first reading will be from Exodus, chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses at Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month that you are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat of the lamb the same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of the raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains in the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be the day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The word of the Lord. Let us read Psalm 116 in unison. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication. For the Lord has given ear to me whenever I called. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things God has done for me? I will lift the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. Precious in your sight, O Lord, is the death of your servants. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. This is our second reading, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord that I also handed on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night which he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to John. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, 
and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also wash my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their masters, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Good afternoon, good evening. Today is Monday Thursday. It is the day when we remember not only the celebration of the Eucharist, but the washing of feet. Mandatu, the command of Jesus, that we wash one another's feet. Frederick Beekner, a great writer, has written this little um, piece in his book, one of his books, and I think it's very appropriate given the time in which you and I are living, that time of the coronavirus, that time when we don't know from day to day whether we will be quarantined, set free, whether all this will stop, and probably, if you're like me, have some question is, what is my place in all of this? So Frederick Beekner says these world, words. If the world is sane, then Jesus is mad as a hatter, and the Last Supper is the mad tea party, and the Monday Thursday washing of feet is the mad hot tub. The world says, mind your own business. And Jesus says, there is no such thing as your own business. The world says, follow the wisest course and be a success. And Jesus says, follow me and be crucified. The world says, drive carefully. The life you save may be your own. And Jesus says, whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. The world says, law and order. And Jesus says, love. The world says, get. And Jesus says, give. In terms of the world's sanity, Jesus is crazy as a good. And anybody thinks he can follow him without being a little crazy too. 
is laboring less under a cross than under a delusion. So, my brothers and sisters, are we living under a delusion? Where do we live with our life? What happens to us when Sunday in and Sunday out we come to the altar and reach our hands out to receive what is the body and blood of Christ? Is that what we're receiving? Or are we just going through a ritual, having no idea what it is or where it comes from? As a child, I grew up in a church where you had to be baptized first before you received communion. And that baptism did not come until you were of age. So I watched my parents Sunday in and Sunday out pass the plate by, take a little piece of bread, take a little shot glass of uh, grape juice, shrink it down, and I wondered, why can't I participate in that? But I never wanted that baptism thing because my daddy said I had to go up there and get in that pool and they had to kind of drown to be in that pool. So I literally waited until I showed up in church the Sunday after John F. Kennedy was killed with my life broken and rent apart. I could not believe this was happening in my country in the country that I thought was so good to the man I thought was so good. And so I put on the note on the bulletin, I wanted to see the preacher. Well, the preacher showed up at our house in shock and after that I was baptized. And so I began to take that communion, but that communion did not have the special place in my life actually in the church where I was, had grown up. But when I began to sing in an Episcopal church choir in Manhattan, Kansas, and I drank that blood of Christ, that wine and that real bread, not just a piece of bread, did I begin to understand the power that that bread and that wine had in my life and in the life of the church and in the life of the world. So it was with Monday Thursday. I grew up again in a church where we kind of went through that and two or three people did it to show us what Jesus might have done. Then I went to the Episcopal Church. It was sort of like that for a while until I got to Meridian, Mississippi as the young curate and the rector there had us take off our shoes and socks and wash the feet of one another. And I remember thinking that first time, what is really happening here? What is happening? I'm washing Jesus' feet? Or am I just washing Mrs. Smith's feet? What I was doing is I was doing what Jesus told us to do that we would have no part in him unless we served and participate in the love and the joy and the camaraderie and the community of one another. And I began to change. The next change really came for me when I was in Huntsville, Alabama. I was the interim rector quite a few years ago. And on the day before, the sat Friday before Palm Sunday, my doctor in Huntsville called me and said that my biopsy had proven that I had prostate cancer. I was undone, fallen apart. I went through the motions on Palm Sunday and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday came around, and it was the washing of the feet. And all of a sudden, who comes up and grabs my arm to take my hand and pull me down to wash my feet, but the person that for the last five months had given me the most hell, had made my life a misery, had not liked one thing that I had done in the life of that church. He was 82 years old. 
And I sat down and I said, no, no, I'll help you. And he got down on his hands and knees and took my shoes and socks off and washed my feet as my face was filled with tears. I realized that I was going to be okay because Jesus had come in the form of that human being and washed my feet. Then, several years later, before that though, I was in Kenya. My parents were gonna to come to see us during the first spring we were in Kenya. My father had had a heart attack and had been in the hospital, and so they arrived in Kenya. And about three days after they arrived at the theological college, we had the Monday Thursday service. So my dad said he wanted to, of course, come, sit on the front row, listen to my sermon, participate in the Monday Thursday service. My mother wanted to have nothing to do with it. So he sits on the front row, the sermon happens, and we begin the process of washing feet. We started from the back. The first person's feet that I washed was the head student. The head student, like many of the students there, did not have proper shoes. Some did not have any shoes at all. Most had flip-flops at the best or shoes that really had big holes in them. And for the first time in my life, I washed feet that were profoundly dirty. The bowl was muddy after I had washed his feet. We proceeded on with that. My feet were washed. And all of a sudden, as everything was about to come to the close, my father, sitting there in the front pew, has the student that I had washed feet first, the head student, come up and say, Oh, Mr. Carlisle, may I wash your feet, please? And my father got up, moved up, sat in the chair, and this young man took off my father's shoes and his socks, and as I was sitting where I could see my daddy's face, he began to weep. The tears began to run down his cheeks and I thought, oh Lord, what is happening here? And we went through the rest of the service. We sang the closing hymn. We stripped the altar. Those who were gonna make a vigil stayed. And I went and got my dad and Doris. And as we were walking across the, la the land to get to where my house was, my father looked at me and he said, I have never been loved like that in my life. To have a total stranger whom I've never seen before come up and wash my feet. Is that what Jesus does? Is that what it's all about? Yes, my brothers and sisters, that's what it's all about. It's about us showing our love and our joy and our peace and our comfort to all. In this time, especially to all, especially to those who are broken, those who are wounded, those who are lost, those who are sick, those who are sore, those who we think are beyond our fence line, those whom we never before have thought we would reach out to. May God give us the courage to do it, and may the Lord give us the power to do it, and may the love that Jesus gives to us as he has maybe washed our feet and fed us with bread and wine flow through us so that we, in our love and our peace, may give it to all of God's creation that we encounter. God bless you and amen. This word about the
the love of Jesus is always the beginning of any time. By remembering the Passover and the Last Supper and the foot washing, we are not trying to get back to an old time. In the face of the suffering and death with which the world is full, is filled, our trying would not come to much. But God's word comes to us now, to our time. Even when we cannot meet for the Holy Supper together, this word which takes these three nights to say comes to us. Jesus Christ is our forgiveness. He is the Lamb whose blood marks the doors of our houses and bodies. In the power of the Spirit, He has washed our feet and our lives. And he turns us toward our neighbors. In this word and in the cross proclaimed tomorrow and the resurrection proclaimed on Saturday night, Easter comes out to hold us already. Jesus. Blessed are you, holy God, for the church. Gather all the baptized around your presence in the word. Strengthen the body of your people, even when we cannot assemble for worship. Grant Bishop Sloan and all our clergy faithfulness and creativity for their ministry in this time and accompany those preparing for baptism. Hear us, holy God. Your mercy, Your mercy is great. Blessed are you, bountiful God, for this good earth and for the flowering of springtime. Save dry lands from destructive droughts. Protect the waters from pollution. Allow in this time the planting of, of fields for food. Make us into caregivers of your plants and animals. Hear us, bountiful God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is, is great. great. Blessed are you, sovereign God, for our nation. Inspire all people to live in peace and concord. 
grant wisdom and courage to heads of state and to legislators as they face the coronavirus. Lead our elected officials to champion the cause of the needy. Hear us, sovereign God. Your mercy is great. Blessed are you, faithful God, for you accompany suffering humanity with love. Abide wherever the coronavirus has struck. Visit all who mourn their dead and all who, who, who have contracted the virus. Those who are quarantined or stranded away from home. Those who have lost their employment. Those who fear the present and the future. Support physicians, nurses, and home health aides, medical researchers, and the World Health Organization. Hear us, faithful God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. Blessed are you, loving God, that your Son knelt before us, your unworthy servants. Preserve our lives, comfort our anxiety, and receive now the petitions of our hearts. Hear us, loving God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. Blessed are you, eternal God, for all who have died in the faith, especially the martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer, whom we commemorate today, and those whom we name before you here. At the end, bring us with them into your everlasting glory. Hear us, eternal God. Your, your mercy, mercy is, is great. great. Receive, merciful God, our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, the host of our meal of life, who died and rose that we might live with you now and forever. Amen. Let us read in unison Psalm 88. O Lord, my God, my Savior, by day and night I cry to you. Let my prayer enter into your presence. Incline your ear to my lamentation. For I am full of trouble. My life is at the brink of the grave. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I have become like one who has no strength, lost among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have laid me in the depths of the pit, in dark places and in the abyss. Your anger weighs up on me heavily, and all your great waves overwhelm me. You have put my friends far from me. You have made me to be abhorred by them. I am in prison and cannot get free. My sight has failed me because of trouble. Lord, I have called upon you daily. I have stretched out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Will those who have died stand up and give you thanks? Will your loving kindness be declared in the grave, your faithfulness in the land of destruction? Will your wonders be known in the dark, or your righteousness in the country where all is forgotten? But as for me, O Lord, I cry to you for help. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why have you rejected me? Why have you hidden your face from me? Ever since my youth, I have been wretched and at the point of death. I have borne your terrors and am helpless. Your blazing anger has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. They surround me all day long like a flood. They encompass me on every side. My friend and my neighbor, you have put away from me and darkness is my only companion. 